In past episodes, when we've talked about buying a home, we've often talked about starting with a budget, not finding a lender, not going out and looking at houses, but starting from really the foundation, which is having a budget. And this isn't something they teach in school, unfortunately. It's something that has to be almost self-taught to some extent. So in today's episode, we want to spend a little bit of time and walk you through the idea of creating a budget. What needs to go into that budget, why it's important, more or less where to start, Josh. So when I say the word budget, Josh, does it make you scared, a little, a little timid? It's not timid. It's not fun. It's, uh, it's, it's sort of like taking fun. your med. It's like taking your medicine, going to the doctor, necessary to be healthy, but never uh, all that pleasant. And with that said, this conversation, if you're married, if you have a spouse, can create arguments. So go in it with an open mind. And I say that from experience, right? Having conversations about money, where money's going, where you think it should go, there's often often differences in relationships in, 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 in the way people view it. So just make sure if you're having this conversation with a spouse, a significant other, other yourself, you're battling yourself in this conversation, you have an open mind because a budget is something that is really going to help you create that financial stability, whether you're planning on buying a house or not, it is really, really important. Uh, but Josh, let's start today by maybe just simple definition. What is a budget? And why is it important? So it's a plan for how you spend your money. So that's the first thing. So I have a plan and it's a system of tracking income and expenses. So you can see how you're matching up to that plan. So we can look at it either way. Some people say, hey, I'm going to remodel my bathroom. I need to get a budget for that. And that means, well, I'm going to plan. What are the things that I want? How much money do I have? And then as we go, we have to track that. What did, how did I do according to that plan? So in the context of what we're talking about, um, it's both. It, it's both. And probably the, the tracking piece is more important. And for most people needs to come before the plan. And the reason why I say that is most people have no idea, Jeb. How many times have we said here on the show that people will come to me and they ask the question, what can I afford? Mm -hmm. I've got no idea what you can afford. Two very similar people same income, same family size, can handle money incredibly differently. As we were preparing for this episode, I read an article from 2019, it was in the New York Times, they did a profile on four families. There was a family in Iowa City that I looked at their numbers and I'm like, these people, this is like, this is rough. They, they gotta be barely getting by. And you read the quote from the, the wife who handled the finances and she's like, no, we're good. We have enough, we save, we get to take nice vacations more often than most people do. And that is purely a function of those people don't live a crazy lifestyle. They don't have two Mercedes in the driveway. They don't have a, a million dollar home. They have two good jobs. They spend very little relative to the income and it allows them to do all the important things. So with that, you know, what is important, a quote that I came across from Morgan Housel, uh, author wrote an awesome book called The Psychology of Money. I would recommend that anyone here listening, read it. Um, Jeb, you were talking about before you get into a relationship, before you get into a permanent relationship in terms of a marriage, going through that book will give you some great information. But one of the big points he said is building wealth has little to do with your income or investment returns and lots to do with your savings rate. So if you don't have a budget, almost impossible to know what your savings rate is. Like if you have very simple finances, you could go and look at your bank statement every month and go, well, I got 500 more than last month and 500 more than the, the before that. So you say, I have a surplus. But for most people, it's not that simple. They're using credit cards, mixing that stuff into the mix. So we have to have a budget and a plan for our income and expenses. We have to track them, we have to know what they are, and then a plan to meet our objectives. Obviously here, Jeb, in the context of the educated home buyer, we're talking about a budget to save for a down payment and closing costs for a home, but it could be for retirement. We talk about that equally being equally important to uh, owning a home. Talk about putting a kid through school. Maybe um, you don't have uh, parents who are going to pay for a wedding and you and your significant other are scheduling and planning for that. You need to budget for all of that. And unless you know where your money's going and account for it all, you cannot make any type of plan. Yeah. And while we're quoting books, I mean, you know, one of the books that's been around forever, The Richest Man in Babylon, and one of the quotes out of that book, George Clayson, if you're not familiar with it, definitely one of the foundational books, I think, to to just financial literacy, to, to understanding finance is, you know, 
um, a portion of it, the quote goes something like a, a portion of all you earn is, is your to, is yours to keep. And basically in the book, they 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 teach the principle of essentially taking 10 percent of your income and saving that money. Right. Not not letting it go somewhere else and, and using the remainder, the 90 percent to take care of your finances or to to, you know, put part of that in savings and part of that towards your budget and, and, you know, to buy a house or what have you. So today we're going to be talking about some of those principles, but also how to prepare yourself, how to put yourself in the best position to become a homeowner. If that's what you want to, to save your money for, if that's what you're budgeting for, you know, we've, we've talked in other episodes, if you're not going to buy a house, that's okay. But if you want to end up at the same place, as 65% of Americans do at retirement with the majority of their net worth being in, invested in something like real estate that creates generational wealth, you've got to invest money in other places to, to create a similar return. And you're not going to be able to do that unless you have the budget. So whether you choose to rent and, and save your money or you choose to become a homeowner at some point in your life, we're going to be talking about the foundation, the fundamentals that you need to know. So Josh, when we talk about budgeting and home buying um, you know, you mentioned the idea of, of what you qualify for and what you afford are really two different things. So let's, I think, build off that a little bit, um, and, and then kind of get in the purpose of, of budgeting to start. I think Jeb, the number one purpose of budgeting and really the income and expense tracking portion of it is to see where your money is going. Every time I do this, you know, we talked last week in the Dave Ramsey episode, Jeb, that you and I are not active uh, trackers of, of a budget, but I do this probably every 18 months or so because I start going, you know what, we've got a lot of little services, little things going along. So I will throw it into an app and have it start tracking and look. And every time there's expense creep, you know, that you don't realize we've got too much going out here, too much going out here. And if you have more than enough coming in that you're able to meet your savings goals, well, hey, no big deal. I have a little bit more going out on streaming services than I thought. I have a little bit more going out on eating out than I thought. Okay, I'm, it's not keeping me from saving for a home, saving for retirement, going on vacations, putting money away for my kid's college fund. My kid's got four legs, so she's not probably, probably going to go to college. But you, you have lots of two-legged kids. Yes. So that, yeah. that's that's kind of the number one purpose to me, Jeb. What, what are your thoughts? No, I mean, you know, what I'll say is I've done episodes, um, you know, in talking about the idea of buying a home, right? How can you set yourself up for success when buying a home? Like, what are the things that you should focus on? And one of the things is obviously down payment and 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 creating a budget and one of those things. And and I often get the response in these videos, people in the comments and what have you going, you know, why does that all, people tell me that, that you know, essentially the, the answer they don't want to hear is that they need to cut back on on what they're spending, right? That that's never the the answer that people want to hear. They want to continue to spend like they're spending and still somehow be putting money in a in a place that is going to either grow or it's going to compound to to the point where they can do whatever they want to do without ever making the adjustment on the other side. You know, the easy conversation or, or, or you know, that often comes up and, you know, when people talk about money is cutting out Starbucks, cutting out different things. And people are like, everybody says that. Well, there's a reason everybody says it because what's easy to do is also easy not to do. You know, the five bucks that you spend every day, yeah, 150 bucks a month. Is that going to make or break most people? No, but that along with the Netflix and, and the Disney plus and the, you know, the Hulu and the, the five other streaming services that you have, those things, when you start to realize you don't need them all and you start to cut back and you say, I'm still going to spend that money, but I'm going to spend it by putting it in a different account, you know, that's going to, create that savings that and, and we're able to invest it in it's going to compound and what have you will put you in a better position now is it going to get you the full down payment maybe maybe not but the, the problem is people don't want to hear the easy solution they want to hear the magic solution in many cases and so with that said you know we've talked about you know you've talked about you know apps and stuff and we're going to get into some apps but the easy answer is to avoid debt 
right? So avoiding it by knowing where your money is going, right? Not not your money telling you where it's going. You know where your money is going. And then figuring out a way to cut in areas so that you have money to go to the other places. A hundred percent. Jeb, as, as a loan officer, if, I, if you talk to me and we progress far enough in that conversation, we're going to pull your credit. And I'm going to say, I have people who know down to the penny exactly what they owe on everything. Most people do not. And most people, when they see their credit report, they're surprised to find out how much they owe. Going back to what you were just saying of determining what's really important, what really matters, what brings you joy in life. I mean, if your cup of coffee is like your number one thing in life that makes you happy every day, and that gives you 20 minutes to meditate, pray, plan your day, and that's like your ritual that really leads, it's, a, it's one of those keystone habits for a, a successful life, don't cut it out. But uh, Morgan Housel in that same book says, savings equals income minus ego. So is... It ego Say that again. That that's 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 big. That's that's savings, really big. Yeah, savings equals income minus ego, and that is not a judgment call. That's not saying what you're doing is wrong. It's saying if again you have this ritual every morning of going to Starbucks, getting a seven dollar cup of coffee, planning out your day, you know, for reflecting on on what is important to you, um, sitting with your spouse and having a conversation. That might be the best seven dollars you spend. If you want everyone to see you with the $7 Starbucks when you show up at the office and it doesn't really bring you any joy, that's ego getting in the way. So it's not a judgment call. It's not telling you when ego is wrong or out of the way. Everyone has to have a healthy ego to be successful. So it's just when does it become above and beyond? Like I sit here, Jeb, and right now I drive a 2017 Toyota Tundra. I love my truck but they redid them in 2022. And I sit here and I look and every day my ego says, you need a 2023 Tundra. But then you go through the numbers and you go, okay, essentially if I sold my truck and bought a new one, I would either have to write a check for $35,000 or finance $35,000. And then I go, does my ego want or need that badly enough? And, and we don't. So those are the judgment calls mm -hmm. that we talk about. And when you say avoid debt, this is what I would say. If you carry a balance without a purpose of benefiting from a period of zero interest, you're not using credit correctly. Like if, if you are relying on it to meet your expenses and it went to, from $1,000 to $3,000 to a five or seven or $10,000 credit card balance, that is problematic. We're going the wrong direction. The two things that we said are most important, if you're not a homeowner, is saving to become a homeowner, saving for retirement. If you're not doing that, or if you're saving 3% in your 401k while growing a credit card balance $5,000 a year, our priorities are out of whack and there's no way of knowing that. We don't know that we're getting further and further away from our objective if we're not watching and tracking it. No. And, and, you know, one thing I say all the time comes from a mentor of mine, people buy emotionally and then they justify logically, right? It comes when, when, you, when you're buying a house, it happens when you're, you know, you, you want the, the PlayStation five, you want the new pair of shoes, you want whatever it is. It's an emotional decision. And then you tell yourself you needed it, right? You need the new truck. You, you, this one's, nah, it's, it's got maintenance issues, uh, the tires, I'm going to have to replace the tire. Like all of the things start to play in, into the, the equation. I mean, I'm in a similar position. I have a 2016 GMC Denali. It's paid for. It's been paid for, for a long, not for a long time. It's now seven, eight, going on eight years old. It's, you know, it's got some wear and tear on it. I got three kids, wife drives it. We take it on vacations. We drive it everywhere. There's maintenance issues constantly, new tires, just things in it that are basically falling apart to some extent. And I go, we, we could use a new car. And then I look and go, okay, interest rates on cars at the moment, insane if you finance it. I'm not going to lease a car. Um, and, and so I start just going through the, you know, it in my head and go, it just, it doesn't make sense. We don't need it. Right. I mean, if we needed it, one thing it right now, it's a, it would be nice to have. It's a want. And for my budget, right. Many of you guys know real estate is down year over year, less transactions happening. So I have to be more mindful right now in where money goes than in a, in a market that's going absolutely gangbuster. Right. If I'm able to still 
meet all the financial obligations that I have, put money away and do everything. And then there's money that's left over, quote unquote, left over, then so be it. But when you're in a, a more of a, a, a when, when the finances change, you have to pay attention to that, right? You can't look at it and go, I'm getting a raise in, in December, or I'm getting the bonus at the end of the year, and I'm going to use that to pay off this. A lot of people do that, and and that can be okay if you're doing it the right way. But what I often see is people living the lifestyle that they couldn't afford to live otherwise by using money that they're going to get in the future to pay it off. And and Dave Ramsey actually has the quote that you know people spend money they don't have to buy things they don't need to impress people they don't like or something along those lines. They don't know. That they don't even know, right? And so it's so, so true. Um, But Josh, you know, with that said, let's talk about the idea of creating a budget. Where do you start? How do you start? Because I think that's the important piece, right? It's, It's easy to say have a budget. It's easy to say do all these things. It creates all these things. But if you don't know where to start or how to start, you're really kind of setting yourself up for failure. So let's start kind of back at step one. What is the very first step in creating that budget? So to me, chicken or the egg, there's there's one of two places you can start and it almost doesn't matter. You can start right in with the tracking. You can say, I have no idea how much money comes in every month. I know what my salary is, but after taxes and 401k withdrawals, I have no idea what it is. So track my income, track my expenses, see where everything is going. So that gives you a roadmap. I would probably start there because most people, it will be eye opening. The other place that you can start is what are my priorities and objectives? Do I want to buy a house? Do I want to max my 401k? Do I want to pay for a wedding for myself or a child? Do I want to buy a new vehicle? Is my car 20 years old and is now problematic? Like whatever your objective is, you need to know what it is and what it will cost to finance that. Um, from, from that perspective, let's go back to my example. If I want that new truck, I need $35,000. Just like you said, interest rates are high and I'm not gonna finance it. So I need to have a spare $35,000 that is not allocated to something else. So if I can budget and I can see that I can have a spare $1,500 a month after I've met all of my other objectives, then in a couple of years, I can go write a check for that truck. Otherwise, I need to make a different plan, a cheaper truck, cheaper vehicle, make this one last longer. So identify what is a priority to you in your financial life, then track and measure income and expenses and see where you have a deficit or where you have a surplus and how long it's going to take you to to meet that objective. Jeb, the most important thing is once you define it and then you measure where you're at, Now you can come up with a plan and this is going to clarify what's important to you right now of those two things, bitch and new truck or no car payment. My, I value no car payment much more. I'm happy to go get in my truck and go, Hey, my truck is seven years old, but it's still awesome. And it still doesn't require a payment. At some point I may go to 10 year old truck and I would value having that new truck more, but until you identify what things you want to accomplish and then identify deficit or surplus and where all that money is going and where you can cut or where you can earn more, whether that means asking for a raise, changing jobs, adding a second job, you can't know what you need to do until you have defined your objective and then measured where you are currently at. No, yeah. And what I like to do, right? There's some apps and we're going to talk about some apps in a moment. What I like to do is kind of just go back and see what I spent, right? So I take the last couple of months. I say, what did I spend in, in, I mean, everything should be documented to some extent, right? If you're paying cash, that it's really even that more, much more important to document where that cash goes because it's easy to spend cash and not have any idea where it went because there's no real way to track it. But what I would say is go back, pull up your bank statements. Pull up your credit card statements, all of them. Yes, I know this is going to be painful for many people out there and start writing that stuff down. I put mine into an Excel spreadsheet. I'm not a big app guy on some of this stuff because I like to see it all at one time in a spreadsheet versus having to scroll different places to see it. Just me and I'm sure there's, you know, computer programs and and websites out there that will show it to you. I like being able to move things around if I need to because personally, I have a personal budget. And then I have a business budget. And to some extent, they overlap. Uh, And that can be difficult in some of the tracking. So if you're somebody out there that is self-employed and 
you're, you know, you have a personal budget outside of your business, start with your personal. Start with that first, and then you can figure out the business budget. And maybe there's two separate budgets. Maybe there's kind of one that overlaps the other. And the reason mine somewhat overlaps is because I'm self-employed. My wife's, you know, she works at home, stays, she's the CEO of the house, if you will, takes care of the kids and everything there. And so I'm kind of managing both sides of everything. Um, and so there is money that gets taken from the business, put into the personal account that pays for those expenses, right? And then there are other expenses that come out of the business and so on and so forth. But what I like to do is take those statements and itemize everything. What's everything I spend on housing? And I categorize it. This is housing expenses. This is, you know, personal expenses, whatever it is. These are streaming expenses. These are whatever. And then sometimes I highlight, depending on what it is, things that we might be getting rid of, things of that we don't really need. Hey, have we used this? Have we not used this? And I'll be the first to tell you that I don't do this every month. It's about once a quarter that I do it. Maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more depending on where we are in the year. But I'll tell you every single time I go through a credit card statement, there are things on there that I'm paying recurring that I had no idea where it came from. Either my kid asked for something and we signed up and didn't realize it was recurring or my wife signed up or I signed up. something there that you're like 40 bucks a month, 50 bucks a month. How long have I been paying that? And then you go back and you go, crap. I've been paying that for three months, four months, no idea. And it's, and I feel like I look at that stuff often and it still gets, you know, kind of gets out of sight, out of mind. And it's really easy to put money in places that, you know, you forget about. So I think that is the really, the, the best place to start. If you're starting at square one, start there, just write the stuff down, see where it's going. What should you include? Gas, groceries, child care, anything. Look at your Venmo, right? Do you pay people out of your Venmo? Look at your Venmo. Do you have people pay you out of PayPal, pay you in? Pay Look at all of those places. Wherever money comes in and goes out needs to be put into the budget because it's all part of the same thing. Let's, Jeb, say say one thing there. Um, if you do it, I think you should do at least a 90-day period, minimum Agreed. of 30 days, so you get a full picture. But 90 days is going to give you a better picture. You might have had an aberration of an expense last month. Jeb had to put tires on his car, 1500 bucks. Is that common? Is he going to see that way. every month? That sucked. But you don't see that every month. So 90 days, you know, a 12-month would be ideal. That gives you the whole seasonality, the whole cycle of a year. But 90 days should give you a pretty firm idea. Jeb made a very important important point that what feels right to you. To him, Excel feels right. There are some amazing apps. Some of the benefits of the apps are the recurring stuff. Um, I threw all my stuff in Simplify by Quicken last night. It's one of the tools we're going to talk about. It gave me a list of every recurring charge that I have. And I went through and I canceled one last night. Most of them I look and I go, no, that's valuable. No, that's valuable. No, I use that. But there was one I was able to cut out immediately. So the far end, the super high techie solution is one of those apps. There's not a right or a wrong answer. Um, I, in several articles that I researched, Simplify came out highly rated and I had not used it. That's why I tried it last night. And, and one thing I want to talk about, the reason I like Excel um, is because whenever I cut an expense off, I kind of, I just put a line through it. I don't remove it from the budget. I might move it to an area in the, in the Excel spreadsheet sometimes of things I canceled. For me, that's like a, a builder, a momentum builder. It makes me feel good, right? I canceled something that was 50 bucks that I didn't need out of my monthly budget. Or in some cases, maybe you have a car, a mortgage that you paid off and you can keep track of it there. Hey, you paid this off. That that stuff builds momentum. You know, you know the snowball effect, Dave Ramsey. We kind of crapped on Dave Ramsey last week, Josh. He's got some really good financial advice uh, for, for the majority of people out there just to kind of get them in that mindset of being able to save money. And he uses the snowball effect, which is essentially is taking all your credit cards, taking the balances, starting with the smallest one first and paying it off. Everybody says, you know, eat the eat the frog, right? You know, eat start with the biggest thing of, you know, when you're trying to do your to-do list, start with the biggest thing, knock that out. It'll create momentum. This is kind of opposite. Start with the smallest thing and then pay it off and see how that feels. Gives you, you know, feels good when you pay a credit card off. And then use that excess money now that you are spending on that one and use it towards the next debt. Once you get that one paid off, use the two that you've paid off, still paying the same amounts that you were paying when you had three credit cards, but now you only have one 
And now you're using it all to pay off that larger card, which in theory, you're putting more money towards it. But it's really that that momentum that kind of gets you going to the next level and, you know, kind of gets you and carries you to the next stage. So, again, Jeff. Josh, we talk about what's the best app? What's the you know, what's the best way? The one the that one you're going to use. use, right? The one that yeah. you will use. Yeah. So a couple a couple things that what you said um, br brought to mind. We just saw in the news either yesterday or today, um, record level of credit card debt in the United States, $1 trillion. Holy I can cow. safely say, that's a lot of money. I can safely say that when we review that, at least 10% of that is frivolous, unnecessary spending. So $100 billion of American debt from 10%? US households, at oh. least 10%. Oh. I'm saying safely, easily. So $100 billion. But here's the important part, Jeb. Well, this time last year, interest rates were much lower. That credit card debt was an average of 21%. Average credit card now is 25%. So we have $250 billion of interest that will be paid on credit cards, at least 10% of which was frivolous spending. You owe it to yourself to do this. Jeb, you're almost passing yourself off as a Luddite here saying, I use Excel. I don't like this techie stuff. I'm going to go back. If you don't even like Excel or a spreadsheet confuses or boggles you. My dad budgeted every month with a calculator and a pen and, and a, a piece ledger. of copier paper. Not yeah. ledger is too fancy, a plain white sheet of paper. And I wanted, Jeb, I went, I, I didn't have time to go over into his storage. My dad passed away in 2020. We still have a bunch of his stuff. I know I have his budgets in there. And it was super simple. He was a school teacher. So he knew every month, here's my salary, here's what my net is. So it started with, here's my net pay that goes in. He started off with giving. He was a Christian gave 10% every month. And he had four or five different sources that he gave to. And here's what I would say. I don't think that the only benefit of giving is religious, where your religion says you need to give away 10%. What I will say, there's a psychological component to giving where you are teaching yourself that you have enough, that you have a surplus. And that will, over time, help you with your spending and budgeting. But going back to the paper, it basically, my dad was pretty simple. He had one credit card. He had one checking account, one savings account. And it was like 12 items long. He paid cash for everything till the day he died, cash in his wallet. And he would say, I'm going to take out this much cash. It's going to go here. So you do not need to use a tool. A couple of comments on tools. So first of all, um, from what I've seen so far in 24 hours of using Simplify, I really like it. Um, Mint is, is very popular. I you need a that. budget, very popular. All of those automate a lot of this, make it easy to pull in many sources of, of spending and, and investing. One I had never heard of, Jeb, is one called Honeydew, D-U-E, yeah. and it's new, and if you're combining finances, so if you're in a relationship and you're thinking about either cohabitating, buying a house together, getting married, there's so many stresses that come with a relationship. Don't let money be one of them. And I will go so far as to say, I know people, I have friends, I have clients who never should have got married because they would never be compatible with their spending and money habits. So let that be a, a piece of this. There is no greater path to headaches and heartaches than a bad relationship. And money is probably the greatest possibility of, of running afoul of one another. Now, what I wanted to mention, Jeb, we've got two free options. Nerd Wallet has a really good one. Rocket Money has a really good one. Rocket Money has tried to get us to spot, do a sponsored show here. This would be a really to good intro to an ad on, right now, on, wouldn't it? On, but they would, they would love to sponsor one here on budgeting. Here's what I would like to point out. Those are both very good. They are free. If a product is free, you are the product. Both Nerd Wallet and Rocket want to sell you a lot of stuff. Mortgages, auto loans, student loan consolidation, uh, credit card offers. You are the product. You will end up paying more. And if you think they're advising you on what's best versus what they have to offer, you would be sadly mistaken. So whether it's $3 a month, $5 a month, $100 a year, I would probably use a paid app. And another comment, Jeb, I was actually in my annual continuing education yesterday, and there was a slide from Freddie Mac in there. And Freddie Mac said, studies find that fintech tool usage is often tied to poor money management. The increased tool usage, in part, explains the lower levels of millennial financial literacy as millennials leverage fintech tools more than older adults. Part of that is that in school, you know, whether you're a boomer all the way through to millennials and Gen Y coming behind them, schools do a terrible job of teaching what is fundamental in your life, which is personal finance. 
the apps can make it better, but if you don't really understand the basics of dual entry bookkeeping, um, debits, credits, keeping a ledger, it, you're going to have a problem with it. So in that instance, Jeb, it's probably leaning towards saying, do it on paper, do it in the spreadsheet, get a basic understanding of what this is, but the tools do do a great job. And as you said perfectly, the best tool is the one that you will actually commit to and use. No, good stuff. So let's kind of circle back here for a moment because this is, you know, the educated home buyer. So we've talked about the idea of budgeting, why it's important, how to start budgeting. Let's talk about two things, Josh, uh, what you really need to budget for, right? So the idea of creating a budget, why you need to budget, I think people understand that concept. Um, but there's a, a almost a misbelief out there that you can still buy a home with really no money down. And, and maybe you can, right? I mean, that's not a, completely a myth, uh, but it's, it's, it's difficult to do. Uh, most loans are going to require some sort of closing costs, some sort of down payment, some sort of lease assets in the bank to show that you have some money, if nothing else, even if you're able to get down payment assistance and do different things, it's important to budget, right? You shouldn't be buying a house if you don't have enough money to buy a house, right? I mean, you still need the money there to budget whether or not it comes from the down payment or goes towards the down payment or the closing costs. So Josh, let's just briefly talk about those two things, right? How much is is safe? Is there a number that we should be thinking about when we're talking about down payment, uh, uh, you know, a percentage wise, a closing cost percentage, just to give people a goal to shoot from? Where should people start? So we have... 3% down options. We have 3.5% down with FHA. If you are either in a rural area or a veteran, you have zero down options, but those are less than 10% of the market. So for 90% of the people that we're talking to, you need to have 3 to 3.5% 3 down for a down payment and be prepared to pay for closing costs and prepaid items. So I would say 5% of whatever your target purchase price is, is what you should be thinking in terms of saving to be ready to buy a home. Does that sound about right to yeah, you? Yeah, no, I think that's fair. And, and here's what I'll say. A lot of people get really um, shy about having that conversation. If you're planning on buying a house, maybe you're not in the position at the moment. It might be a year from now. It might be six from months from now. Maybe, who knows what the time frame is and you're unsure of how much you need, have the conversation with the lender. These are free conversations, guys. Lenders are there to guide you through the process, to to to, to build relationships, um, and, and really earn your business and your trust. And most lenders are going to have that conversation with you. They're going to tell you, hey, based off what you're trying to do, you know, what you're willing or able to spend per month in a budget, this is essentially your price point where you would be. And in turn, this is about how much money you would need to have in order to accomplish your goal. Is that not fair, Josh? Is that a conversation that you have with people, you know, that are considering the process that are completely new to this whole a thing? Great, a great example, Jeb, a uh, gentleman, listener to the podcast here, reached out last Thursday. We connected on Friday and he called back on Monday and he said, hey, based off of our conversation, I think I need 60 days. And we go through it and I go, I don't disagree. I think 60 days, most people, when they think in terms of 60 days, there's not much that's going to change. He had a couple of things that I'm like, that will put you into a better position. So he goes into, I have a task on October 8th to give him a call and pick up that conversation. And every month, the beginning of the month or whatever day of the month, I have calendar reminders of people I talked to six months ago, 12 months ago, three months ago. What happens if the plan is, hey, I'm going to do it in 12 months. You have what Tony Robbins calls the law of diminishing intent. The longer you put off doing something you plan to do, the less likely you are to do it. There's an element of that. If you're thinking you want to buy, um, unless you are very diligent in terms of saving, planning, and working a plan over a 12-month period, I would say three to six months it should be enough to get your ducks in a row and be ready to go. But it's not my call. You are 100% correct. That initial conversation is to help you determine where you're at where you want to be, and are we ready, or is there a gap to cross, and what is our plan to do it? I There's a giant misconception that when we send a calendar link, say, hey, get on my calendar, let's have a call, that that's a sales call. I'm there to sell you a loan. I don't ever want to sell anyone a loan. I don't ever want to talk anyone into buying a home. I want to facilitate you making the best decision possible with your finances. And for 60, 70% of the people that I talk to, that is buying a home and figuring out an optimized plan for doing that. And that may mean three months, six months, 12 months down the line and not today. 
And it's ironic you brought up the the law of diminishing intent because I would say for most people, that's the budget that we're talking about in today's episode, right? Is the yeah. idea of, uh, yeah, I'm going to get to it. I'm going to do it. Uh, and then what happens is most people don't do it. They end up talking to the lender first, having the conversation. The lender tells them that, hey, you're approved up to this amount. And then that's what people go and spend versus working backwards and knowing what they're comfortable spending and saying, you know what, Josh, yeah, I might be approved for 500000 but I think I really need to be around you know, this amount monthly, and then you equate that to 400000 or whatever the number is. So the budget really is the foundation for home buying, for really life in general, just knowing where your money's going versus wondering where it went. So Josh, let's do a little recap here, um, a conclusion, if you will, you know, Top couple of things that that uh, listeners should be getting out of this episode. Come up with a plan of what's important to you, what you want to accomplish. Again, that could be buying a house. It could be buying a car. It could be paying for a wedding. It could be just maxing out your 401k. Come up with a plan. Then track for one to three months all of your income and expenses. You can do that today going back. Almost everything today, we have it digitally. And if you're going to put it into a spreadsheet, most Banks, credit cards will export to Excel format or you can pull them in there. This is not that difficult, but it's going to take three, four hours over the course of a weekend. Go back 90 days, pull that all together, figure out where you're spending. The stuff that maybe doesn't necessarily show up there, let's look in terms of we want to account for what is my housing and utility expense, everything that goes into shelter. What am I spending on transportation? Do Am I in an area where I take the bus every day or do I Uber everywhere? Do I have a car payment or do I just have maintenance on my auto? What am I spending on food? How much do I spend at home? How much do I spend out? Uh, What do I have in terms of debt payments, credit cards, auto loans, student loans? Student loans are a big one. Uh, You know, millennials, we talk about a lot because they are the prime buying age and they're about a third of the buying market. And student loans are a big issue for them. One thing that doesn't get accounted for, and I don't think people have a really good understanding of is their taxes, the withholdings from their payroll. I think this is a great opportunity to dig into that and say, am I over withholding where I'm getting a big refund at the end of the year? Am I under withholding where I'm afraid to file my taxes because I have a payment? Um, things of, like childcare, if you have kids, what, what does that look like for you? Do you have family that covers it or do you have a really high end daycare that you send them to? The last two are giving. Do I wanna give? How much do I have to give? Uh, and then savings. Dave talks about an emergency fund, one to three months, three to six months of living expenses. That's awesome to get that built just in terms of reducing anxiety and stress. Um, Big picture goals that we talked about, buying a house, planning for retirement, major life expenses like weddings, uh, school, education for kids. Those are the, the big things. Pick a tool, commit to it track it. And this doesn't need to be a thing where you're looking at it every day. Jeb, you've talked a million times on the show. Please don't look at the value of your home on Zillow every day. You don't have to look at this. Uh, I would say minimum would be quarterly, preferably would be once a month to just check in and say, how, how am I doing? Am I budgeting properly? Are my income, is my income getting allocated properly to expenses to allow me to meet the things that I stated are my goals? Those would be the big things to me, Jim. And I think those are the big things. So with that, you know, as we always say, buy right, borrow smart, build wealth. And there's one other quote that comes to mind. Wealth, like a tree, starts from a tiny seed. Is that something that comes to mind? That's a quote. I don't know. I think it's something along those lines. But essentially, wealth comes from starting small and let, letting it build over time. And you can do that by creating a budget. So we appreciate double, you listening, double, guys. Double, double, double down on that, Jeb. When was the best time to plant a tree? A thousand years ago. When's mm-hmm. the second best time to plant a tree? Today. today. So that tiny seed, you may not have anything, but you have a tiny seed. If you have things that you want, today is the day to make the plan and plant that seed. Good stuff. Until next time, guys. Adios. Amigos.